The views, information, and opinions expressed during the following program are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent the views of Access Communications, its representatives, or its employees. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the regular meeting of the Wayburn City Council held in the Council Chambers at 5 p.m. Monday, October 25th, 2021. The first thing we will ask is the approval of the minutes of the regular Council meeting and strategic planning priorities meeting held October 12th, 2021. Do we have a mo motion, please? Your Worship, I'll make that motion. Second. I'll second that, Your Worship. Call the question. All in favor? Carried unanimously. Additions to the agenda, Mr. Warren. I thank your worship. There's none from administration tonight. Rest of the council. Nothing. Moving forward, public hearing notices none. Tonight we have a delegation. The young fellows uh, are requesting. We have uh, Todd Bador and Sandy McCormick here. If you would please come forward and read your letter, of, if you would. Your worship, if I may. Okay. Um, it's rare that I am pleased to declare conflict, but as a member in good standing of the Wayward Young Fellows, I am and I do. So, with your permission, I will recuse. Okay. So, one moment until sure. Mr. Janky leaves. Okay, go forward. Go, forward. go ahead. Well, thank you very much. We're uh, we're really happy to be here tonight. The uh, Wayburn Young Fellows Club was started in 1922, and in 2022, we celebrate our 100 years. We've been part of the community for that 100 years, and over the past, past we have donated, a, we have hosted a plethora of fundraisers, and we are constantly pivoting to remain relevant. Recently, we are, we are focused on a few large-scale events, Christmas tree lot, internet auction, uh, comedy night, in November, unfortunately had to get canceled this year, and our various catering, catering events with our commercial smoker. With the onset of COVID-19, once again, we had to pivot and sold over 120 cords of birch firewood in Southeast Saskatchewan. We average, we average about $80,000 net every year for revenue, and a cumulative total over the last 99 years has been around $2.5 million donated back to the area. Our donations over the years have normally rely on someone bringing your request to the club. We sponsor numerous athletic groups, Red Cross school program, swim program, um, to grade two to five students. We pay for Sunday public swimming, United Way, Salvation Army, local bursaries, the family place, school breakfast program, Wayburn Caravan, Don Mitchell Spray Park, and numerous other individual groups that approach us for funds. We have tried to cover all age groups with all these funds. For 2022, we're looking at a project a little bit different. We're currently referring to as our Centennial Project. We're planning to have the event be an actual donation back to the uh, community as a thank you for the 100 years of support. Thank you to the community for the 100 years of support. The entire community has made it through the past 20 months of COVID-19. Everyone in our community has had to make sacrifices for this awful thing. We want this event to be affordable for all and open for all ages who can attend. This event is depending on us getting enough community sponsorship to cover the major cost. It is planned to be an outdoor celebration later in the summer months of 2022. Later on gives us a better chance of avoiding rain events and hoping to be able to put COVID-19 behind us. An outdoor gives us the best chance of having enough capacity and allows for people to be safe outdoors. Thank you, Todd. Um, as an example of the potential entertainment that we're looking at, the Hunter Brothers has been a name that's come up. I'm not sure if every, anybody's really familiar with them. Uh, High Temple Country Music Group, born and raised in Seanovan, Saskatchewan. And this group has got really, really strong family ties. They operate a large farming operation and have a very strong hockey background with them. Basically, they are really what Saskatchewan's all about. 
The energy that they bring to the stage is incredible. I had an opportunity to see them in Saskatoon a couple of years ago. And when I watched them, I thought, you know, if ever there was an opportunity for the Young Fellows Club to bring the, this group to Weyburn for something, you know, I had to think about what it was. And unfortunately, COVID gave us that opportunity. Uh, they play to the crowds, their energy is infectious. It's exactly what community needs to pump up their spirits after this long battle that we've had with this pandemic. This project is a work in progress. In conjunction with this, we are hoping to have something for the small kids in the community. We've talked about something at the Don Mitchell Park that day, um, bouncy houses, different things that, that we can do for other activities. Uh, quite a large undertaking and we feel that through the various organizations that we support, that we ha would find enough manpower from the various um, sporting groups and, and different organizations that we've donated to, to have them come and provide manpower for food, drinks, and it's an excellent way for them to give back to the community as well, we feel. The Young Fellows Club has committed to this project in a fairly big way and we're looking forward um, to finding some support from other entities within the community. We don't wanna go out to a whole lot of, of sponsors like we do with the internet auction and some of the other ones. Uh, we feel that four or five major sponsors along with us would give us enough that we can, can comfortably uh, proceed with this. The likelihood of this having excess, excess funds at the end is a high probability. We're proposing that all of the excess funds from this project, uh, all net excess funds, would be returned back to the community as we've always done, but this would be a little bit different. We are looking into identifying four or five worthy re recipients or projects or, or entities in the community that funds could be donated to, and then empower the individuals that are within the community and or those that are in attendance at this Centennial Project to decide via an online voting process. So you would, we would figure out a way of, of identifying five and, and have it broke down. I think we would want so, all of them to get something, but to proportion it based on the votes that the, that the community feels is important to them. We feel that the city of Weyburn is a perfect entity to help out with this project. We hope that you feel the same way as we do about this project and that this checks off all the boxes for you to consider a gold sponsorship level. I think that would be all we have as far as that goes and we would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Council? Yes. First off, has this been, the, 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 you have the sponsorship levels and that? Okay, so I don't have to go through that. Thanks, Your Worship. Guys, thanks for coming. I, I don't really have any questions. I just want to thank you for 99 years of service. I know you maybe weren't around in year one to five or so. Some okay. might think I was. One of them were. <laughs> Anyways, thank you for this and thanks for your support. It goes a long ways to making our community pretty cool. Thank you. So best of luck with this one. Mr. Mickel, anything? I, I do want to thank you, gentlemen, for what you've done for this community. I mean, it's everything you've done at this point is positive, and you can see it when you walk and drive in the city of Weyburn. Uh, the timing is right for this, this request because we're in the budget process right now. Uh, what I'd like to see done is that we, we put those numbers to our budget, and you'll know very shortly by the end of probably November, either yes or no. And that's probably the route to go. So we have other people requesting funds as well, and uh, pri we have to prioritize what we feel is important. As, as a budgetary item, and that's probably what I'd like to see done, is throw it to the budget, Your Worship. We go from there, and then we make a decision, and then we'll get back to the young fellows. But thanks again for all the work you do. Thank you. I've had the opportunity to work with you guys. I was a young fellow's wife for the longest time. Thank you so much for all that you guys do. I loved helping out with all of the events that you've put on, and I've taken part in some of the organizations that you guys support, and they would not be there without you guys, so thank you. Mr. Moon Van Betcher. Yeah, thank you, but I, I think the idea is fantastic. I was just excited when I read about it, and hopefully we can sit down and, and find a way to to make something that work somehow, but uh, it's, I, I just, I love the idea.
just reiterate what everybody else has mentioned as a past young fellow, um, currently not active, but I fully support the, the concept of, of this and I look forward to hearing more details as they come out and uh, look forward to a fulsome discussion regarding support of this, uh, this idea. So congratulations on all the, all the projects and, and what you've done to support the community in, in the past 100 years. I mean, Wayburn wouldn't be Wayburn without the young fellows. So that being said, uh, we're, what's going to happen is we're, we'll be going to budget here and we'll, as Dick said, that we'll let you know um, near the end of November what this, their decision is. So we thank you for your time here tonight and uh, we'll go from there. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yep. On to the next item, uh, reports on standing committees. Mr. Van Betju, the Police Commission minutes, please. Thank well, you, Worship. Uh, just a minute, moment, please. Uh, we have to find our Ryan. He's coming. Oh, he, Larry, he's coming. So, thank you. All right, thank you, Your Worship. A regular meeting of the Weyburn Police Commission was held in the administrative boardroom, 4 p.m. Tuesday, October 19th, 2021. Uh, board Chair, welcome Constable Jake Sonnenberg to the meeting. Constable Sonnenberg advised he has been with the Wayburn Police Service for almost six years and gave a brief career history and advised he is currently a field training officer. Const Constable Sonnenberg left the meeting at 4.10 p.m. after giving us some detail of his uh, history with the Wayburn Police, which the board has been doing for the last few meetings. We've been bringing a... Uh, different officer into every meeting to kind of give us a little bit of a bio on themselves so that the board can meet some of the, uh, the members. Uh, additions to the agenda, moved by Barclay Charlton and seconded by Councillor Van Betu that the following items be added, municipal police equipment amendment regulations and an update on dis displaced individuals. Chief Blunden provided the mayor's report Wayburn Police Service monthly stats, Wayburn Police Service six-year average, crime prevention stats, charges, mental health assist, medical calls, overtime report, and year versus year overtime report. Chief Blunden provided a brief update on the email he had sent out to the board on October 16th indicating the funding he had received through the criminal forfeiture fund in the amount of $29,000 to purchase and train a canine for the Wayburn Police Service. Chief Blunden advised the City Council has approved the $20,000 overage in the 2021 budget to replace install overhead doors for the police building garage and the tender for supply and install deadline is October 27th. Chief Blunden provided the accounts payable report for September 2021 and then provided a budget update for the year to September 30th showing revenues are sh short by 176473 expenses over by 51,691, putting the total net overage at 228,318, but still waiting on grant funding of 144,045, which would reduce the total overage to 84,273. The air exchanger from Prairie Controls came in at a cost of $57,000 and was budgeted at $50,000 so the funds were taken from the women's washroom upgrade plan for 2020 and was put into the 2022 budget. Chief Blunden provided the bylaw report for September 2021. These reports are accepted and passed in new business. Uh, the board chair welcomed HR consultant Spagro to the meeting to discuss, to discuss COVID-19 policy and proof of vaccination for employees. Councillor Van Betch advised there needs to be discussion around setting policy for the Wayburn Police Service for a proof of vaccination or mandatory COVID testing policy. Deputy Chief Van de Sype advised the Wayburn Police Service have impl implemented a policy and have taken the city's employee policy and made some minor changes. The board was also advised that Chief has allowed for those that do not wish to be to provide proof of vaccination with free rapid testing at the beginning of each tour. 
Chief provided an update on some of the amendments to Section 12 of the Police Act 1990 as follows. Allow for the use of semi-automatic pistols, 9 millimeter caliber. Increase the minimum time period for retaining records of serious assault offenses from 10 to 75 years. At 5.10, the, moving, the meeting was moved to in camera and then out again at 5.37 and the meeting was adjourned. Any questions? From that, uh, we'll just uh, record that these have been received and moved. <coughs> and these will again be found with on the city website. Consent agenda, council receivable. Do you have a motion, please? Yes, Your Worship, I'm prepared to make a motion that the item on consent agenda, the council receivable report for September be accepted as presented. I'll second that, Your Worship. Questions? Seeing none, call the question. All in favor? Carried unanimously. Council payable, do you have a motion, please? Yes, Your Worship, I'll motion that the purchases in the amount of $810,121.96 from October 8th to the 21st of 2021 be approved. Second? I'll second that, Your Worship. Questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Carried unanimously. Tax enforcement, six month notice. Laura, if you would. As for section 23 of the Tax Enforcement Act, a six month notice is sent to, to um, properties that haven't paid their tax, their 2020 taxes. So um, all of these properties will be um, sent a letter that, and anyone that has an interest in that property, a title interest will be sent a letter as well. Um, they'll all be given the opportunity to redeem the land before the city authorizes proceedings to request title and with the provincial mediation board. And then so once after, after the six months period has taken place, then the city requests from the provincial media mediation board, board for consent of title. So in total, there was 55 properties that we will be sending letters out to. Do you have a motion, please? Your Worship, I move that the city assessor be authorized to continue under section 23 of the Tax Enforcement Act to serve six month notice to all properties that still have outstanding property taxes from 2020 original roll for a total of $74,194.25 as presented. I'll second that, Your Worship. Questions? Go ahead. I have a question, Your Worship. But, uh, or is, is this comparable to a year ago, the, the amount of, of uh, residents or commercial buildings? Yes, it's very similar. Very close? Yep. Laura? Thank you, Your Worship. Laura, I know I sent this to you before, but these are all residential properties, correct? Um, I believe so. Most of them, Any other questions? No? Call the question. All in favor? Carried unanimously. <clears throat> drainage channel cleaning, RFP. Uh, yes, good evening. So this is a drainage uh, channel RFP. Um, so the city of Weyburn utilizes overland drainage ditches in various locations within the city for stormwater drainage. Purpose of these drainage ditches is to direct stormwater flow away from the road surfaces. If they aren't properly maintained or clean, blockages can occur from vegetation debris and sediment buildup, resulting in standing water ponds and storm drains backing up onto the roadways. Standing water presents a hazard to drivers, breeding ponds for mosquitoes, and can contribute to physical de deterioration of roadways and developed property. The engineering department has identified and prioritized four drainage ditch locations that currently require cleaning due to blockages. The priority location is the Saskatchewan Drive and Fifth Avenue drainage feature. There are no records of this drainage feature being grubbed, cleaned, or maintained since construction in 1988, besides cleaning the outlets on the east end in 2019. This location has mature trees, willows, and brush growing within the ditch, as well as large amounts of sediment buildup at the Fifth Avenue and King Street outlets that are restricting downstream flow and subsequently impeding stormwater drainage on Fifth Avenue. 
The other drainage dish locations requiring cleaning and maintenance are the 16th Street Storm Drain Outlet, directly south of the Weyburn Humane Society, and the Ebel Road Drainage Ditch extending south between 16th Street and Paul Road. The 2021 budget has a total of $35,000 assigned for drain drainage channel maintenance. On October 4th, the uh, drainage channel cleaning um, RFP was posted on SAS tenders and the city website. Repos proposals were to be received by the city of Weyburn no later than October 18th at 1 p.m. Uh, so a total of four proposals were received with only three of those pr proposals considered fully responsive to the RFP. We have a summary table below um, of three companies that supplied um, quotations. They did have the option to bid on all the pieces or um, as many as they wanted. Um, and so as you can see, um, in some of them they went with a forced account. That means they would invoice on an hourly rate and were not willing to give a lump sum. All proposals submitted were reviewed to ensure bidders submitted all response requirements, including a detailed methodology, proposed equipment use, drainage maintenance experience, the required qualifications and insurance, and could meet the project completion date. Only one of the proposals met the full requirements initially. Additional information for missing response requirements was requested from the other three proponents on October 18th so that a fair evaluation could be conducted on all the submissions. Only two of those proponents responded with the missing requirements in the given time frame. To give a summary, um, Jerry Manil and um, I'm not going to say all those numbers. Saskatchewan Limited submitted competitive pricing with the exception of the Saskatchewan Drive location. For that location, Jerry Manel did not provide unit pricing and proposed to invoice on a forced account basis. Jerry Manel submitted the lowest bid for locations two and three, and the, um, the Saskatchewan Limited submitted the lowest bids for locations one, four, and erosion control products. The mulcher equipment proposed to grub the vegetation on SAS Drive drainage location is an efficient and cost-effective method that essentially eliminates the storage, transportation, and disposal of the grubby wood and wetland vegetation material. Despite um, this company's slightly higher cost for location two, it is a recommended to award locations one and two together to be completed as one project. They are a connected drainage feature um, with a similar kind of vegetation in them and would result in consistencies and project efficiencies. It is recommended to award location four to Jerry Manil in lieu of location two. The summary of cost for the project, which includes cleaning of all four drainage dish locations, erosion control products, and the mobilization cost is below. This includes PST and GSPT. So total project cost based on um, the proposal before is $35,534 against the budget of 35,000. It is recommended that the 2021 drainage channel cleaning locations one, two, and erosion control products be awarded to 102115858 Saskatchewan Limited for a total cost of 23,576, including taxed. And then it's recommended that the 2021 drainage channel cleaning locations three and four in lieu of location two be awarded to Jerry Manel for a total cost of $11,958.03, including tax. Do you have a motion? Your Worship, I'd like to make the motion that the following bids be received to provide drainage channel cleaning for the City of Weyburn as follows. 101-211-5858 Saskatchewan Limited, Saskatchewan Drive, Grubbing and S Saskatchewan Drive Sediment and Fifth Avenue at $23,576 including tax and Jerry Manil Limited, 16th Street and Ebel Road, $11,958.03 including tax. Do I have a second? I'll second that, Your Worship. Questions? Go ahead, Mr. Janke. Uh, Jen, I can't help but be a little concerned that uh, one of these is an order of magnitude higher than the other two. Um, do we know why that is? Um, I <laughs> I, I can't even explain that much of a difference. Um, based on what we've seen though, we feel that that is more of an outlier uh, than anything and we feel that the other pricing is more in line with what we expected. So I, I can't even, I can't even explain that. <laughs> All right, thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Mickle. Thank you, Worship. Uh, Jennifer, 
uh, the anticipated plan to get this started to this is this fall or this spring or next spring uh, so the the plan is they have to have it completed by March of next year is the is the deadline and um, it would honestly it depends a bit on your freeze up and and things like that and weather and and because you do need somewhat of a a bit of a ground there for them to get in and do it so um, but the they do have to have completed by spring of next year well one more question and I hope you don't, I'm not throwing you under the bus but when they start digging this out is there any any imagination of, of contaminated soil in there uh, no there's in, no con, there's no expected contaminated soil in this area in, in those drainages yeah, it's not anticipated to be. Okay, thanks. Laura? Thank you so much. Jen, um, is this going to be a one-time project or is this going to be 35,000 year after year to continuously clean out these particular spots? Um, so for somewhere like Saskatchewan Drive and Fifth Avenue, they have not been done since 1988, basically. So um, this one is probably more of an extensive um, of removal um, than we would see. And then the plan would be to do it more on an annual or biannual basis at a lower cost so you wouldn't have that big massive buildup of brush and tree and stuff um, these other ones have been done in the past a, a little um, there they've been done more recently so they aren't as extensive but our expectation would we we would be doing some kind of maintenance on these to prevent them from getting to this point seeing no other questions are we there Call the question. All in favor? Carried unanimously. Water treatment plant process improvements, if you would, yeah. All right, thank you. So in 2020, the city of Weyburn hired MPE engineering to conduct a disinfection byproduct reduction study at the water treatment plant. The source of water from Nickel Lake has high organics as measured by total organic carbon. Due to the elevated concentration of organics remaining in our treated water, disinfection products, DBP, in the form of trial THMs and HAAs can exceed regulated limits. So this study recommended three systems to help address these issues. Enhanced coagulation with a CO2 system can improve organics reduction and filtered turbidity values. Chloramina chloramination with an ammonia system reduces the formation of potential DBPs and a powdered activated carbon PAC pack system can be used to absorb total organic carbon as well as address taste and odor issues stemming from the presence of organic material. Detailed design was then conducted on these three systems to prepare for tender. The budget for the process improvement gates were as follows. The PAC system was 675,000, the CO2 system was 320,000, and the ammonia feed system was 230,000. The total budget for all projects together was 1.225 million. MPE Engineering from Saskatchewan created the bid proposal and did the public tender opening on behalf of the City of Weyburn. The opening took place <coughs> on Thursday, September 9th, and a total of two proposals were received. <coughs> Um, so as you can see below, TransCanada contracting and contact, contact general uh, contractors bid on um, the four um, the four systems. So um, just to explain prime cost allowance, that is actually um, the commissioning and programming associated with those systems. So it's kind of broke out to show you what is required to do the programming and commissioning. MPE also requested proposals for the CO2 equipment and bulk supply of carbon dioxide system and a total of two proposals were received. Um, and so what you can see there is um, an upfront capital cost that has to be invested. And then um, it's a contract that has varied pricing based on the CO2 you get. So based on the annual operating expenses of the system, um, that's what they're expected to cost us annually to continue to have CO2. So in summary, um, upon review of the tender proposals for the construction of the systems, the cost came in much higher than our budgeted amounts. MPE and city administration reviewed the projects and determined the CO2 feed system and ammonia system provided the best value and addressed the THM and HAA exceedances. This allows us to stay within budget for 2021, but still address compliance issues. The engineering department still recommends proceeding with the PAC system when additional funding becomes available, as this will further help with our organic content as well as address odor and taste issues. 
With this, MPE went back to the lowest bidder, TransCanada Contracting, to discuss the deletion of the PAC system from award. After discussion, the award of schedules B, C, and D would be $766,237.45, including PST and GST. The proposals for the bulk supply of the CO2 and associated equipment were reviewed and despite slightly higher costs is recommended to proceed with Air Liquide based on their past experience for level of service, product knowledge and ability to del deliver on short deadlines. So just to give you a summary, based on these recommendations of the CO2 and ammonia feed systems, the CO2 equipment and engineering costs is below that it would be a total of $1,133,100. $1,133,136.85 to a budget of $1.225 million. So it is recommended that the 2021 water treatment plant process improvement upgrade schedule B, C, and D be awarded to TransCanada Contracting Limited for a total of $766,237.45. And then it's recommended that the 2021 water treatment plant process improvement upgrades, CO2 equipment and bulk supply be awarded to Air Liquide as outlined in the proposed gas supply and service agreement. Do you have a, a motion, please? Uh, Your Worship, I'll make a motion, but <clears throat> I only have a motion uh, for the second part of that. <clears throat> Excuse me, that this, the council approve the recommendation of the Director of Engineering to enter into a contract to set out in the Crest proposal from Air Liquide uh, to provide CO2 equipment and bulk supply of carbon dioxide for the City of Weyburn water treatment plant. Do you have a second? Do you have a second to that motion? Your Worship, I'll second that motion. Okay. All right, so let's take, deal with that motion first. On to there. Uh, questions on that? Yeah, I, I do. Yes. Thanks, Worship. Jen, thanks for this. It's, uh, this is very, I, I would suggest complex it was, is an understatement of this, uh, for, especially for me anyways. So can you help me understand, so the, the, the PAC uh, system, we're not going to do that. We are going to do the feed system. So, uh, and you had suggested that perhaps down the road, we would, we would reconsider the PAC system? Uh, yeah, so um, I basically um, when we assessed the cost versus the value it's going to give us, um, CO2 and ammonia, um, because they were a lower cost and we are out, we are not in compliance on THMs and HAAs all the time and we would need to be in compliance all the time, that we're targeting those based on their price, they give us the most value and should actually put us in compliance the whole time. The PAC system will still help with that, but it is a lot more expensive as well as it's gonna, the other side to it, it'll address the, toter, the taste and the odor issues, which are cosmetic, I guess you could say, in the sense of compliance. Um, the biggest thing um, about it is we, this um, PAC system, the engineering's been done, and it is a shelf-ready system that we can come back to it and add it in. So we've had to go, and um, that's why the, the cost slightly varies a little bit, because we do had we did have to rework some of the piping and stuff when we took the PAC system out, but we are leaving the ability to add it in if we can get the funding um, and the engineering department would be asking for the funding in a s upcoming budget. Okay, thanks. That, because that was kind of, I guess, long run. My question was going with the CO2 uh, feed system doesn't, doesn't is, isn't, I wouldn't say money wasted. I'm not phrasing that right, but it's not gonna be in the way down the road of the PAC system. It would be just be an additional element that's added on. Thank you. Questions? If we were to add a PAC system later on, does that mean we have to have downtime on the treatment plant again, or is it provisioned away from that? Um, I, would, I would have to confirm um, exactly, um, but the biggest thing of what we do when we plan our construction is we, te is we um, plan it in our winter months when our demand is lower. So our plant isn't always um, producing water full time um, because our capacity, we have the capacity in the reservoirs. So in the sense we, we always do our construction and our tie-ins at, at our um, lower demand months so that it can just be tied into our regular when we're not running the plant. Yeah, perfect, thank you. So with that, uh, I guess the question that asks is, do we need these two systems right now? Or is it better to do it right now 
I know we've kind of gone around and around on this one there, but do we really need to get this done right away for the improvement? The CO2 okay. and the ammonia? Yeah, oh, and, and, and the PAC system. I know the PAC you said is a polishing one, on that and it just makes and, it better. And I, but, but I don't want to undersell the PAC system because it, it does actually it will help even more with our THM and HAs. That's why these three systems are kind of tied together. It's just we understand the budget constraint side of things. Um, but these basically are required to be done because we are not in compliance all the time and we really struggle um, when you have lower runoff years um, like now and your water level is not seeing that precipitation your organics build and they're higher and that's what creates your higher thm and haas and so you end up during especially seasonally out of compliance so yeah this is basically a requirement of our permit that we have um, told the water security agency we will be addressing these and that was through this study and then these modifications so I guess my question becomes should you should we just hold off and set this aside and wait and say see if you can find the money or see if you can come up with some very creative ideas of getting the money so we can get this all done to all for of all three as opposed, pardon me for all three yeah for all three to get this done because so that we so we're not we're not just hobbling it along and nickel and diming it along on the way if this needs to be done, if this is a requirement, this needs to be done, this is gonna give people a good quality water here, and we can move the people off the, uh, push the idea, if you don't need treated water, don't use treated water, but use it, our well over here, and then get this good quality water, because we always want good quality water for people, then can we not see I, if we can be creative to get this money? I, I think you could honestly, approve these two and get them started this year and they will not finish in this in this budget year because they're gonna go through out this winter into the spring like our goal would be with the co2 and ammonia to finish them by next spring so if you wanted to add the pack system in it it wouldn't be a massive thing because it is shelf ready the provisions will be there okay does that answer the question is there okay so let's go forward then so do we have a call the question? All in favor? Carried unanimous. Next, did you have, who's got the first, for the first one? I'll, I'll wing it. Okay. Uh, I'll make a motion that the 2021 water treatment plant process improvement upgrades schedules B, C, and D be awarded to TransCanada Contracting Limited for a total of $766,237.45. And I'll second that, Your Worship. Call the question. All in favor? Carried unanimously. There we go. So we'll move forward. We'll work on our water again. Something near and dear to me and to much of our council, to all of our councils, not just myself, to all of our council here. Uh, introduction of bylaws, uh, council procedure bylaw amendment. Uh, Danette? Thanks, Your Worship. Um, so uh, the current council procedures uh, bylaw actually does not um, allow for electronic meetings. Um, and as you know, we did hold electronic meetings uh, for just over a year from spring of 2020 until uh, spring of last year or this year. Um, however, uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, government relations, I checked with the Minister of Government Relations and they gave leeway to cities that did not have that uh, in their um, council procedures bylaw. However, they did suggest that, you know, we work on adding this in. And um, so this summer, once we were out of, back into council chambers and out of electronic meetings, I began work on reviewing the council procedures bylaw. Um, so along with adding electronic uh, meetings to uh, be allowed at our council meetings when required, uh, there was just a few other housekeeping matters. Uh, one item was the Cities Act was amended in 2020 to um, add in um, that a designate other than the city clerk could call a special meeting in the absence of the city clerk because currently it had said uh, before 2020 only the city clerk could do it. Well, if I was, if the position was vacant or the city clerk was unable to for some reason absent, um, then there would be no way to call a special meeting. So um, I've added that in um, uh, designating the city manager as the backup to call a special meeting if the city clerk is unavailable. Uh, a couple of other items um, that also 
uh, we're asking to, or that council has um, suggested to be changed, is rever reversing the order of the council meetings from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. and strategic planning and priorities meeting back to um, 5 p.m. Um, we, we did this uh, in the reverse for the last few years, but have determined that um, it's just more, um, works better to uh, reverse them back. So um, January 1st, if this passes, and uh, this would only receive first reading tonight, as this bylaw is required to have public notice because it's council procedures bylaw, um, it would not take effect till January 1st, just to allow um, for everybody to be notified of the change if this does pass. And then the only other amendment that I've presented is uh, just a little bit of wording change to appointments on boards and committees. Um, because some of our boards and committees have what we call a terms of reference, where they may state terms, uh, maximum terms or minimum <coughs> terms, probably maximum terms um, for s some various boards and some boards and committees don't. Um, so we just want to clean up the wording so that one isn't in contravention of the other. Um, if, if there's a terms of reference that it doesn't contraven contravene this bylaw, so that will just clean that up. And if council uh, proceeds with first reading tonight, I will do a public notice um, for the next two weeks in the local uh, media as well as on our social media and on our website and then bring it back on November 8th for possible second and third reading. And again, this would not take effect uh, till January 1st of 2022. Do you have a motion, please? Your Worship, I'll make the motion that Bylaw 20 21 34 37 to amend the Council Procedures Bylaw 2018 3390 for the City of Weyburn be read a first time and further to that administration advertised as per City of Weyburn Public Notice Policy Bylaw 2003 2094 and be brought back to the November 8th regular Council meeting for second and final readings. I'll second that, Your Worship. Discussion? I guess I have one question to ask all of council before we move forward with this, that with our busy lives and our work and everything, is this five o'clock uh, time, uh, time? Uh, I guess we have, uh, you know, the way we're moving it around here, are we gonna be okay with these times on this? I know that we start council at five, but I'm just saying is the way it's gonna be sorted out and everything, is this gonna be any issue, these timings, change of timings? That's cool. Uh, if you're looking to me, I would suggest it's still five o'clock, yeah. so uh, it shouldn't make. It's just that it, it shouldn't be impactful. It shouldn't impact. I'm just and I'm just wondering now because council is going to be at six. Is there impact to the people not being able to see, or is this going to be better for the pe people at home? <laughs> you think different strokes for different folks? I would think. I would argue in regards to that, if anything, it's a marginal improvement. I mean, it makes very little difference to us. We're here the same amount of time, but for anyone who's watching on. TV or coming down, it might give them a little more time to reach open council as opposed to. So I, I don't think it's a big deal, Your Worship, but so, okay. be, if that were the determining factor, I'd be in favor of it just on that. I know oftentimes folks get together in groups with popcorn and, and everything <laughs> in council. So you're right, Councilor Jenke, that extra hour after work to prepare could be beneficial for sure. Yeah. The the, the exciting, uh, what's it called, live TV sort of series Precise. that we're doing here. Monday Night Live. Monday Night Live, yes we are there. I'm just was uh, bringing that forward. So it would be an improvement, and that's what the answer I guess I'm looking for. This would be probably improvement that people will be able to see council more so if they are so interested in getting that yeah. popcorn ring. Your Worship, if I may, the one other thing that sometimes can happen is when we have something that requires a, a fair amount of uh, deliberation, uh, sometimes we slow ourselves down a little bit because it gets bumped a week, or, or not a week, it could get bumped two or three weeks before it gets to a strategic, um, uh, strategic planning and priorities meeting. This way we've got some time in advance of council if something, if a delegation needs to be present where there's sensitive information. So in fact, there's a couple of ways this, this might really be beneficial. Right, okay. So with that, call the question. All in favor? Carried unanimously. Moving forward. The, uh, Bylaw repeal, uh, repeal of a bylaw, the repeal replacement administrative review body. Go ahead. Go ahead, Danette. Sure. Um, yeah, I can just uh, give you just a quick rundown. Um, uh, our HR consultant actually was uh, kind of uh, tasked with doing a little bit of um, uh, work on finding out about administrative review bodies in other cities. and. Um, 
based, I'll give you a little bit of history that this bylaw came into effect in 2003 as a requirement of the Cities Act. Um, since then, it's been removed as a requirement. You can still have it, um, but you aren't required to. And so a lot of the cities have gotten away from what we call an administrative review bylaw. Um, this bylaw would set a process for complaints with a requirement that the city must have a review officer appointed to investigate, appointed to investigate complaints to set out uh, that is, are set out in the Cities Act. Um, and how, but however, the city hasn't appointed someone because it's not really been something we've needed or required. So we're not really following this bylaw and a lot of other cities were finding that they too didn't have anybody appointed and it's kind of difficult to appoint someone when you never need them and then you kind of forget <coughs> about it. Um, so what we're, uh, you know, what I'm suggesting uh, in this report, uh, as, as per the HR manager's, uh, HR consultant's re uh, recommendation, is that we repeal the administrative review body bylaw but replace it with a whistleblower policy which we will look at later if council chooses to repeal this bylaw as well as um, a, a bylaw regarding, um, let me just find the exact name, respectful conduct and harassment prevention for council and senior administration. So this is just more, maybe more of a, a more current way of dealing with uh, complaints, the whistleblower more for um, employees and uh, whereas the respectful uh, conduct and harassment prevention for council would be something where it would be more uh, complaints about council or senior administration. So these, we still will have um, something in place for people, uh, whether it be staff or uh, the public to, to file complaints. Um, and there is still gonna be a process. And outside of that, there is also provincial agencies that look after that as well. So I do think that there is, um, it's well covered um, without the bylaw and with the new policies. Um, so yeah, I would just, uh, if council so wishes, um, to give this three readings tonight, then we can repeal that bylaw and move forward with approving those two policies. Before we move forward on this, I would like to discuss and say we set aside this repeal of the bylaw until we, we talk about these two policies that are, are on here, both the whistleblower policy and the respectful conduct policy. There's just no use in, we should leave the, my, I think we're kind of getting the cart before the horse as it were here and repealing the bylaw. Let's, we should be looking at these policy approvals first before we get into the, uh, into this uh, 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 repealing the bylaw. The bylaw I feel should be left in place until we get the, uh, the policy approval onto it. Why would we leave something empty until we get the approval, full approval? Your Worship, if I could just get some clarity on your question. Your suggestion is we are just reversing items A and B? Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, I would just say to, that we, let's, let's talk about the policy, the, the whistleblower policy approval first and the respective conduct uh, harassment before we uh, repeal this bylaw. Sorry, pardon me, yeah. yeah. You're looking, you're looking to jump ahead and do 10 A and B and then yeah. go back yes. to do 8 B. Yes. Do I understand that's that right? Correct. That's correct. Okay, well, if, if you wish to do it that order, you would have to make a motion to, um, to change order on the agenda. I guess we should have maybe done that at the beginning, but that's okay. Uh, so if council wishes, you could make a motion to uh, move over to new business, and I believe that is on our... Uh, yeah, you could go to new business, uh, item 10A and 10B, and then return to the bylaw if you wish to, or you could leave the bylaw and we can bring it back to the November 8th council meeting. It's whatever council chooses to do in the motion where they would move to change the order. Your Worship, I'll make a motion that we, uh, we move ahead to new business and address items 10A and B, and that once those are completed, we return back to uh, introduction of bylaws item 8B to address that item. Your Worship, I will second that motion. All in favor? Good, moving forward. Then policy approval, council whistleblower policy. <clears throat> I'll speak to that, Your Worship. Um, so, if council decides to repeal the administrative bylaw body, uh, review body, um, there is two policies we want to look into, and I'll speak to the first one uh, first here, which is the whistleblower policy. So as it in included in the report provided by uh, City Clerk Richter, and also in the policy put in place with, uh, in front of council tonight, 
Uh, this policy allows assurance for employees that uh, their concerns will be take, taken seriously, their identity will be protected, and they will not be subject to detriment, treatment, retaliation, reprisal of um, employment harassment as a result of legitimate complaints. So what we're trying to do is provide a voice for, for our employees through this process. The purpose of the whistleblower policy is to provide protection to any employee of the city uh, reporting a complaint related to issues of wrongdoing and also enables the creation of procedures for prevention, de detection, reporting, and investigation of suspected wrongdoing as well as a process for reporting and resolving complaints of retaliation. Um, so as uh, included in the report from uh, City Clerk Director, this is something that the cities are doing right now. Uh, it's something that we're strongly encouraging Council to approve this policy. Uh, right now, um, as indicated before, uh, the policy we have in place isn't um, really doing everything we want to do um, for our employees going forward. Um, whistleblower policy are, provides a voice for these people um, who, who want to voice their concerns in a very um, proactive and uh, really um, straightforward process, what they want to do. Do you have a motion? Your Worship, I'll make a motion that the whistleblower policy for the City of Weyburn be accepted as presented and come into effect immediately uh, following the approval of the policy. Second. Your Worship, I'll second that motion. Discussion? Go ahead, Lord. Thank you, Your Worship. I think this is really important to have in place for our staff, but it also gives council direction as well, because we are the voice of citizens of Weyburn, and if they do happen to come to us, it gives us the opportunity to direct them in the right direction to get their concerns heard and um, definitely uh, solved. Mr. Richards? What she said. Yeah. I, will, I will be a descending vo uh, descending voice, and you're, uh, as somebody's favorite prime minister, not mine, but somebody else's favorite prime minister, has once said that we have to listen to even the descending voices that are out there. And my descending voice is that a whistleblower policy most certainly does not uh, work all the time. Anyone, this is the best that we can do, I know. But a uh, whistleblower policy does not protect people. They have gone, and we, Edward, Edward Snowden is one of the biggest ones that you can see, he, and it does not work. So if you're thinking that this is gonna be a silver bullet that's gonna save everybody along the way, they're not. So this is the best that we can do, though, and I, would, I don't know why we're gonna do th anything better on it, but I just want to make sure that people do not uh, realize that this is not going to be this silver, wonderful, utopian uh, policy that's going to save people along the way. Thank you, Your Worship. I think nothing's perfect and nothing covers 90, even 99 percent of the incidents, but I think the policy is very well written. It gives, I think it gives our staff, our employees, something to, to know that they will be backed as much as we can. Like I say, nothing's perfect, but I think we need to have something in place to make our employees feel like they can be recognized if they do have an issue to bring forward. Thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> I agree, nothing is ever perfect, but this is far, far, far better than anything we have in place right now. And it does what we need it to do for the time being until such time as we can Evaluate as time goes by, and if improvements need to be made, they'll, they'll be made at that point in time, just like we're doing today, improving what we have right now. Go ahead, Mr. Jay. Your Worship, you make an excellent point that uh, the policy is not in and of itself going to do anything. It's the people we have behind the policy who are going to enforce it, who are going to follow it, who are going to use their judgment that are going to make this work. And I think we have excellent people, so I'm confident in that. And you're also correct, a lot of times these things are not valuable. A lot of times they don't work, but the small percentage of time when they are necessary makes it worth having it for the entirety of the time. Um, I, I do have one question, Mr. Warren. Uh, you said this applies to all um, city employees. Am I correct in understanding that it includes in scope and out of scope? That's correct. All right, thank you. No further things? All in favor? Against one descending. 
visa gain, and I've stated my fact. The next policy, so passed unanimously. Respectable conduct and harassment prevention for council and senior policy. Go ahead, Danette. No, nope, that's my as well, Your Worship. So uh, I'll speak to this one as well. So it's the second part of the policy we want to put in place to, to assist what we want to do moving forward as a city, uh, which is a respectful conduct and harassment prevention for council and for senior administration. Uh, so this policy focuses on establishing a respectful and harassment free environment. Members of city council and senior administration are leaders and role models uh, for the city of Weyburn, civic boards, uh, commissions, authorities, and committees and we should lead by example and conduct in building and maintain an environment that is respectful and harassment free. Um, this policy has been put in place uh, to provide clear indication of acceptable and not acceptable practices and processes for complaints. Uh, so again, uh, we're following the lead of some of the other cities uh, by putting this in place. Uh, we, we truly believe in a respectful workplace, harassment free workplace, by putting this in place, it just provides a little more clarity to, to that. Again, to what uh, Council's talked about tonight, not everything is perfect, uh, but this will provide us a lead to what we want to be moving forward as municipality. Motion? Your Worship. I'd move that the respectful conduct and harassment prevention for council and senior managers policy for the city of Weyburn be accepted as presented and coming into effect immediately following approval of the policy. I'll second that, Your Worship. Discussion? I would like to discuss three things that I think. I think that number one, a lot of this in our very woke society that we have today and our very thin-skinned society that we have today to me this is a very uh this policy uh, is is good but at the same time it has to be flushed out way better and a lot more definitions out there so we have things where one of the council may uh just uh, simply say, you know, um, direct or indirect, you know, say for the number one is sexual harassment, direct or indirect, unwelcome remarks. They may uh, say, oh, that's a nice uh, tie that you've got on or something. And the person may take this completely wrong as to what was perceived as to, to be said. So within that, there's where I would say, I would like to see far greater definition onto this. When it gets into personal harassment, where do they talk about uh, into whether it is uh, on their uh, the stating on a person's uh, adverse effects on a person's physiological, physical well-being, uh, and also um, they're stating here, and I have to get my glasses on here, to, uh, to uh, they talk about uh, on their, uh, whether they're talking about their, uh, their, their weight, their size, their, uh, uh, a religious orientation on, on such and there. There becomes the, the point where, again, you need more expanded uh, on this, as in, especially when it comes into the religious uh, aspect of it, when they're talking about uh, uh, there. I, as an atheist, is that, dis is that discussed as a religion? Some people define it as the largest growing religion now. Others say that's not a religion. So then all of a sudden they say, that's not a religion, it's not there. I want far more uh, detail as to these definitions. This other point that it has in here, that it said that uh, the, uh, uh, it talks about how to, uh, refusing to work or cooperate with others while at work. Especially when it comes into this, where that it's going to be judgment on this council here and sitting and working here, and or also how we talk about and discuss things. Sometimes uh, discussions can be become very heated and discussed as we have stances of the left and the right and there and working together. So now all of a sudden it's going to be who's going to get to the phone first to complain about how they feel that they were slighted on the other, and then it becomes uh, the if you read through this. The things that can be done to council, especially, they can be suspended from coming into due to the hall while there's investigations happening, coming into city hall. They can be suspended from their committee meetings. They can be suspended from their pay, although they can be elected officials still. They can have all these things, which, again, we as council are politicians. 
This is a great policy for the senior management, but we are politicians where I can say to Dick, I don't agree with what your stand is on this, and he and I have arguments about it, and we're not gonna, we're not, we are politicians, we do not need to have one of these things where we say that they can phone and say, oh, I want to investigate because we can't get along and work together because we have opposing things. Of course we got. The liberals don't agree with what the conservatives are saying, and what are they gonna stand up and say that we're not uh, agreeing with this? So <clears throat> this, <clears throat> this policy is really fantastic for senior management. Council should be left out of it, or else if council is not left out of it, I want to see some vast array of uh, uh, huge definitions uh, opened up as to this, because these are very vague as to what they are, and they can be interpreted just very vaguely, and it's, it's, it's a way too vague uh, thing, especially when it comes to council. Uh, when it gets into council and what's considered harassment and et cetera and all that. Mr. Jank. Your Worship, if I can speak to the uh, vagueness, I get where you're coming from with this and I agree with where you're coming from, but I don't agree with your solution. Uh, my experience has suggested that putting too much detail into this is actually going to make the problem we're talking about worse, not better. Uh, we could write a thousand pages of policy on this and we'd never even begin to cover every possible thing that might come up. Having a lot of particulars in here opens the door to somebody finding something that details something similar to what happened and saying, this is clearly said in this policy that uh, your comment about a hockey team I don't like counts as harassment, when clearly it does not. Uh, putting too much detail in here allows the details to be weaponized against somebody else in an invalid harassment situation. The vagueness opens this up to, I guess for lack of a better term, common sense. I'm more comfortable with it being more vague than trying to put unnecessary detail into it just to get us to the same goal we're talking about here. Go ahead, Laura. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, like Brian, sorry, Councillor Jake, you said uh, about the previous policy, it's, nothing's ever perfect, but I think it's important that we have a framework or a jumping board to start with, and then we can direct administration to go back and make amendments as necessary, and that's something we can discuss at this table, maybe at a closed session to bring forward to the public later. Mr. Richards. Thanks, Your Worship. Yeah, I, I'm with Councillor Morissette and Councillor Jenke. Um, big policy generally equals big problems. So you'll never be able to identify everything. And the moment you start trying to say everything, you're gonna miss something. I think this is a really good policy. When I, when I um, <clears throat> read through it as a councillor, I, I can't speak on, on behalf of administration, but I think it's good, it's good both directions. When I look at this as a councillor, I don't see a spot where Councillor Mickle and I are gonna differ. Even though we torment one another relentlessly on four-way stops, that is not gonna become an issue that is abusive. There's no harassment in that. Even if, even if one of us carries a, a particular color of politics and one is a different color, uh, that also is not going to equate an abusive situation or any harassment. What this is about is making sure people are safe when they're here. Safe doesn't just mean physically, but you have, you have that, that intellectual and emotional safety when you're in a room. And this policy lays that out, I think, in fine fashion. This policy is 11 pages, so it's not a lightweight. It is a hefty policy. Uh, I think it's well done, and I, I will be supporting it tonight. Yes, I agree. It's, uh, I, I will totally support the policy. And I think, uh, you know, as everybody said, there's so many incidents. You could write pages and pages and pages. And I think the basis is that harassment or, um, you know, respectful conduct or non-respectful conduct is based on what a, a reasonable person would assess as respect or as disrespectful. So there are guidelines and it, there's references in there to Saskatchewan human rights and other sexual harassment policies that can, you know, if we, that you can delve into to get into more serious cases. So I think the policy is very well written and I think it sets a standard and guidelines for us as counselors, for one, and as employees as a whole. And I think we need that to remind ourselves to be respectful of others. 
agreed. Um, it sets the groundwork for the environment that we all want, and that is to be treated as we would treat everyone else around the table. And I believe that this policy sets out to do that and does it well. And I will fully support this, this policy. Mr. Mickle? Thank you, Worship. Your Worship, I'm going to agree with you tonight uh, on one thing. You started a great discussion, and this is very interesting for the City of Weyburn, to have an open discussion about a policy and different opinions surface. I agree with you on that. I will not support what you say, but it was good dialogue that we had. You brought out your thought process and it spared everybody else to talk about it. Thank you, Your Worship. And uh, you, the motion is on the floor. And uh, I, I can see where you're coming from, but you've created good dialogue here, and that's a plus. So with that being said, and I've said my piece, I'm not, uh, and you can't go back on, you can say one piece and, and that's what, uh, that's where our bylaw is. I've said my piece, and with that, I'll call the question. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? One. Going forward. We would, then we go back now to bylaw, repeal bylaw, uh, replace administrative repeal review bylaw. Worship, if I may, I move the bylaw 2021-3438, a bylaw to repeal bylaw 2003-3019, the administrative re review body bylaw for the city of Weyburn be read a first time tonight. I'll pass that, or I'll second that, Worship. <laughs> Discussion. It's seeing that these, these bylaws, the council as a, as a whole body has uh, approved the, these two uh, bylaws that uh, there will be, there's no use in having this bylaw here on the books as, uh, with, the bylaw, uh, with this. So moving forward, all in favor? Unanimous. Second reading. Your Worship, I move the bylaw 2021-3438, a bylaw to repeal bylaw 2003-3019, the administrative review body bylaw for the city of Weyburn be read a second time. And I'll second that, Your Worship. All, we call the question, all in favor? Next. Your Worship, I move that uh, bylaw 2021-3438, a bylaw to repeal bylaw 2003-3019, the administrative review body bylaw for the city of Weyburn be given three readings at this meeting. All in favor? I second that. Second. Worship. All in favor? Carried unanimously. Go ahead. Your Worship, I move the bylaw 2021-3438, a bylaw to repeal bylaw 2003-3019, the administrative review body bylaw for the city of Wayne be read a third time and passed. Second that, Your Worship. All in favor? Unanimous. Now, 10C, COVID update. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just with all the changes happening with public health orders, we thought it'd be really beneficial to provide uh, information for discussion for council, um, the public health orders and how it affects our facilities and, and maybe what we want to see moving forward with our facilities, uh, but we'll leave that to discussion for council tonight. Uh, so tonight I have uh, Trevor Tessier and Dr. Nabley from the Action Health Authority. They'll give an update to you guys. Hopefully auto, audio works for that, uh, for everybody. Um, but I'll start with my update on this report. So background. Um, there's two things that uh, currently happened uh, from the province. Uh, on September 17th, uh, the government of Saskatchewan implemented a public health order that requires, requires non-medical masks in all uh, public indoor spaces. Uh, as we were aware, on, on October 19th, they updated that order to extend into, into mid-November. On October 1st, uh, proof of vaccination and negative test results uh, will be required in Saskatchewan um, for public access for a range of businesses, event venues, as well for government officials and staffing. Uh, so on October 19th as well, the government of Saskatchewan updated that order with further information. Uh, the one thing that we've been trying to do as a, a city is continue to align ourselves with uh, what the experts are, are telling us from uh, Government of Canada, Saskatchewan Health Authority, and we always do rely on those expertise from those people. Uh, so tonight I do ask, and I will put it on the screen, I'll hopefully the speaker will work, uh, for Dr. Navley and uh, Trevor Tessie from Health uh, to provide um, information on, on transmission, vaccinations, and other recommended, recommended uh, measures for uh, Weyburn. 
So just let me get everything set up here, guys. Just give me some time here. Trevor, Dr. Nally, can you guys hear me? Yes, I can. Um, thanks. And Council, can you hear? Yeah, I can hear you, Matt. Okay, do you guys have the presentation? Do you want me to put the presentation on tonight? Um, you can put it on. Okay. Okay, you guys able to see the presentation? And Council, can you see the presentation? Okay, I'll let you guys start. Just tell me when you want me to go to every... and thanks for advancing the slides for us here. Um, so my name is Dr. Stanley Nadeli. I am a medical health officer with the Saskatchewan Health Authority and um, also have um, our director here, Trevor Tessier, um, supporting me in this presentation. So I need the... Uh, I just want to introduce myself. Hi, I'm Trevor Tessier. I'm the director of primary health care for Wayburden area. Thanks, um, Trevor. So, uh, thanks everyone for this opportunity. I know that we've been um, facing challenging times, getting close to 20 months now, and I do want to appreciate everyone's efforts. I know that COVID um, directly or indirectly has impacted our lives. So, I do appreciate this opportunity at least to give a little bit of background information on as to where we are at in the Weibon small area geography. So, um, this is the first slide. And uh, so please, um, if you have any questions, just um, pencil it down, or any down at the end of the presentation, we can go over those questions. So this is just um, a slide that shows our Canadian outlook. Um, currently, this was a um, slide done a few days back on Friday. Um, but it's still the same picture for the most part today, because I checked in. So we see that Saskatchewan has the highest case rates in terms of the last seven days uh, for the whole of Canada. So in terms of the number of new cases, overall, we are not doing, we are not doing too well. We are the, almost at the bottom. We still have a few territories up north where it has the worst in terms of case rates, but certainly we are now like the talk of Canada right now, especially now that we are having to transfer uh, patients from the ICU to other provinces. So we can move to the next slide. Um, and yeah, um, so this slide also shows our vaccination rates in Canada. And um, still, we're not doing too well here. Um, we also are almost at the bottom in terms of our vaccination rates across Canada. So we have other provinces um, who are doing well in terms of being fully vaccinated. And by fully vaccinated, we mean an individual that received the second dose of um, the COVID vaccine. And um, at least 14 days afterwards would have elapsed such that that individual at that time would have developed um, adequate immune response. So we are still not doing too well when it comes to our vaccination rates. So we can move to the next one. All right, uh, so this just shows um, our trend, case count and cumulative cases, starting from August, um, which was about, I would say, two weeks after the initial July 11th public health orders were rescinded. Also, if you can look at the, um, both the bar chart as well as the line chart that shows the cumulative cases are put on the upward trajectory. But I will mention that um, in the last few days, we have noticed a slight decline, being mindful of those public health orders that came in place in October the 1st. So likely we are seeing a bit of plateauing, but that is just recently. And um, it does show that these measures do work, at least in helping to control and mitigate the impact of this um, of the pandemic and locally to wave on. So we can move to the next one. So um, this slide just looks at um, 
the history of comparing the Saskatchewan history, which is in the red, and um, the Wimbledon small area geography in the green. So uh, you can see for the most part, especially in September, where we had lots of cases in the Wimbledon area, um, very high above the Saskatchewan rate, and slightly we can see even just um, a few days after the recent public health order on October 1, we started noticing a bit of decline and uh, compared to the Saskatchewan rates, we want it doing at least better for now. So that is also good, but it has to take the effect of those um, public health orders and those measures um, included, like the masking in the policies and also the proof of vaccination and the ACE test policy for us to have this now downward trend that we are seeing. So the next slide, please. All right, so this is just giving us a little bit of outlook uh, in terms of each distribution of our cases since um, August the 3rd. So if you look on the left hand side here, we have the age group broken down and the uh, number of cases and the percentages. So just strictly speaking on percentages and just taking a quick look at that table, you would see that about 40% of our cases are in those who are less than 18 years of age, primarily our school aged cohort. So we still see that we are seeing a lot of cases in this cohort. And currently, even in the less than 12, you can see that they have the highest um, case at 25%. And that is the group that is not even eligible for vaccination. So they are unprotected at this time. And Really, without the vaccination, that just goes to show that they are the most impacted in terms of cases right now. So as you go further down the table, um, in, in increasing age, you can see that the number of cases or the case rate decreases. And that goes to show, you know, that the vaccinated cohort, and the more we go in terms of our age, the more the proportion of individuals in those various age um, Cohorts have been vaccinated. So if you look at the 60 plus, that is the um, age group who are eligible for the booster. And you can see that the case rate there is really small, at about 5% from August. So it does show at least some of the effectiveness of these vaccines. Then on the right hand side, you look at the vaccination status of cases in August as well. So you can see that the majority of our cases. Um, just looking at this between almost 90% in total, uh, or let's just about 75% or even 80% are partially or unvaccinated or ineligible to vaccinate. So we have a very small proportion, proportion of fully vaccinated individuals who are cases, but the vast majority are in the partially or unvaccinated group and of course the ineligible group. So in terms of what we are seeing for our transmission dynamics, we are noticing or identifying that most of our cases are related to household contact um, in community settings by becoming cases to contact based on community settings. And also we are noticing exposure in our schools as well. So those are the three major areas where we have had our clusters of cases, households, community settings, as well as in our school age um, population. So we can move to the next slide. All right. All right, so this is just um, giving us a little bit of background regarding these um, vaccinations. So it takes about 21 days after the test goes for an individual to at least mount an immune response, which at that time is not yet sufficient because we are not fully vaccinated. But um, after receiving the second dose of the vaccine, um, you become um, have a, you have a robust immune system two weeks after that second dose. And um, really, what we are seeing and anticipated that serious illness rates will decrease as residents receive this second dose. And um, to do this is what what is at least currently recommended for most individuals, except immunocompromised or you are over the age of. At this moment, so yes, um, we have seen that um, this vaccination does um, prevent serious illness, 
um, ICU admission, hospitalization, and, as well as mortality. So we can move to the next slide. All right, so this just shows our vaccine uptake as of Friday. So um, similarly, we can see that in our elderly population, as we go upwards on this table in the first column, you see that our first dose vaccination rate is really good. Um, our second dose was also good as we move upwards on the age cohort. Uh, but by the time we come to the lower age cohorts, we still are not doing well. We are thinking that the public health order has also helped um, with the proof of vaccination in those school age cohorts to have a better uptake because we've seen a slight um, improvement. Um, compared to Saskatchewan, we are not doing too badly in the Weibon's more geographic so, area. But definitely, what we do know and what the science is telling us at this time is that we are looking at anywhere upwards of 85 to 90 percent to achieve that herd immunity or what I would say um, community immunity. So um, the more we can get um, individuals as much as possible vaccinated in our communities, um, the less likely that they will be affected with hospitalizations and ICU admissions. And definitely we do not see mortality at all. Please next slide. So this is just looking at um, epidemiology, comparing vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals. I think this is a Canadian-based data from Public Health Agency of Canada. So you can see that among 19.7 million individuals who are fully vaccinated, just about 0.16% of individuals have had confirmed infection. But when you um, compare that with among 21.5 million partially vaccinated, 0.2% confirmed infection. And uh, from December 2020, um, 2021 in September, 4% of confirmed cases occurred in fully vaccinated individuals. So um, we'll look at some other slides still from Public Health Agency of Canada that looks at hospitalization as well as mortality comparing fully vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals. So we can go to the next slide. Yeah, so this is looking at the hospitalization rates among unvaccinated compared to vaccinated individuals. So you can see the first um, bar chart on the left, um, the rate of new COVID-19 cases among unvaccinated individuals is 10 times higher than in fully vaccinated individuals from the Public Health Agency of Canada as well. Then the rate of COVID-19 hospitalized cases among unvaccinated individuals 36 times higher when compared to fully vaccinated individuals. So that is also another data that shows that um, the fully vaccinated individuals are better protected as compared to the unvaccinated individuals when you look at hospitalization and um, case rates. So we can move to the next slide, please. Yeah, so this um, also similar um, messaging, but in a different way. So we are looking at um, Canadian data um, of the incidents, but this time looking at it from a line chart perspective over time. So here you can see um, in the blue uh, for incident rate is for those who are unvaccinated, and the red should be for those who are fully vaccinated. So the incidence is lower in those who are fully vaccinated and also the hospitalization rates are also higher in unvaccinated individuals compared to fully vaccinated individuals. So um, that's another slide from the Public Health Agency of Canada. We can move to the next slide, please. Yeah, so um, this is um, our testing. So just looking at um, our testing um, rates um, over time from August currently sometime last week. So you can see our testing rates really plateaued in September when we were seeing lots and lots of cases. Um, we're seeing overall testing rate is decreasing. Um, we do know that there is a rapid antigen testing out there distributed by schools and others. So we do know that others are also testing. Um, maybe using those rapid antigen.
testing test. Most of our role we are seeing is declining our testing rate. Um, so what we want to see really from public health, we want to see our testing rates go up, but at the same time, you know, the test positivity, the proportion of individuals who test positive should be going low. That way we know we are treating cases early and we can quickly act the proactive good interventions in case to mitigate the spread. So that's for the testing rate. And we'll come to the next slide, please. But yeah, so this is the test positivity. So the proportion of individuals who came out for testing that got a positive result. So um, yeah, very marked increase in late August. Uh, remained stable for a long time. Then in September again, we also had another peak. And recently, we have seen a slight, like a decline. Um, recently, but being mindful of the fact that those rapid antigen tests are out there and how individuals who are using them, and perhaps maybe not showing up at our testing centers. So we might have you know, a bit of under reporting for our cases that we need to be mindful of as well. So, next slide, please. Okay, this is just showing the impact of vaccination, looking at it from the lens of Saskatchewan, right? So, the yellow line shows um, unvaccinated individuals in Saskatchewan, individuals who are not yet protected. Um, the lighter green line, I think, shows those who are partially vaccinated. Um, but the dark green line shows individuals who are fully vaccinated. And this is a line chart that goes over time from September um, right down to, um, I guess, the second week in October. So this also just speaks for saying the same show where um, fully vaccinated individuals um, and a lot um, catching or acquiring the infection as compared to um, the unvaccinated individuals. Next slide. So um, this is just our um, main messages. Um, practice for the way one small area geography. So we're seeing case rates slightly decreasing recently. Um, I think in the um, impact of the public health order are uh, likely responsible for that from October 1st because we noticed that decline started happening, you know, few days after that um, order came out. Then the test positivity for the way one small area geography is also declining, but it's still relatively high. So we're still having high test positivity rates. And we have seen that the proof of vaccination requirement has greater gains, um, particularly amongst our young um, age cohorts, which we are still seeing having the highest proportion of cases, right? And not forgetting that we have those between the ages of 7 and 11, which at this time don't even have any protection from the vaccines. And um, vaccination, yes, from the different charts you've seen, both locally, Saskatchewan, and um, even um, federally or nationally, that vaccination does make a huge difference and in both case rates and hospitalization rates as well. So the next slide, please. Yeah, so um, maybe if there's one thing I want us to leave, you know, this meeting with is this Swiss cheese model. I'm sure we've all seen this, you know, before. So. Um, we just have different slices of the cheese with different holes. So it's not just one thing alone that can help us um, control the spread of this infection. We have to use multiple strategies from you know, individuals staying home when sick to practicing good hand hygiene to ensuring we have good ventilation to the vaccines itself and um, to even masking and other policies. So it's a constellation of all these things put together that can help us to appropriately control this. And um, I know as NHO, we just recently put out another position statement to the ministry. And um, at this point, I mean, we're also members of the community. And um, we also share your concerns, right? We do not want to see us, us as a, a population or as a community going to lockdown. That is really not a goal. We believe that if we all as um, collectively and, and as individuals put this together, having these vaccinations together with masking indoors, I mean, we are 
most most likely going to protect our very vulnerable, especially our very elderly, right, who have multiple comorbidities. And I'm sad to say, even at this time, that um, our mortality is really mostly seen from those who are in that elderly population at this time. So that's the Swiss cheese model. We'll move to the next slide. So, well, this is looking at the situation across Saskatchewan currently. So our uh, test positivity across the province is still high. So that is concerning. Um, I mean, from the different charts, we've seen COVID vaccination does prevent severe outcomes, which is the hospitalizations and the hospital mortality. And um, even right now, as I speak, I know how constrained and um, tired that our public health nurses are. They really are feeling burnt out and been on this for many, many, many months now. And even our acute care as well is also under imminent threat. And um, we now, at this moment, are having to um, lift our patients in the ICU to Ontario. So that is also concerning now. So the next one. So our key public health mes messages have really not been different. Um, we're encouraging everyone to mask, um, especially when you're away from your home. You know, at this point in time where we are, um, irrespective of your vaccination status, until we can achieve that better herd immunity, um, physically distance and wash our hands and sanitize. And this also helps other respiratory infections. Like last year was like a dream for us in public health. Um, where we did not see much flu, it's just simply because we have all these measures in place. Um, let's also minimize close contacts and non-essential travel at this time, just um, to protect our, ourselves and members of our community at this time. Um, stay home, even if you have the mildest symptoms, and get tested. And if you can work remotely, we're encouraging those individuals who can still um, work remotely to do so. Of course, outdoor events are better than indoors. And um, means as soon as you are eligible for the vaccine, employ you to go get them. Um, of course, we're looking at different employer mandates for implementing pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical interventions, one of which is now the proof of vaccination and negative test policy, which is one of our, the tools now that is effective in our toolbox. Next slide. So overall, our recommendations uh, for us to continue to advocate the government um, regarding, regarding limiting gathering sizes, especially if you're unvaccinated. Um, we know that the outcomes are more severe in those who are unvaccinated. Um, encourage uh, vaccinations and um, proof of vaccination and negative test policy, which I believe is one of the considerations being put in place by council and I'm I'm happy to hear that you guys are strongly considering this at this time. Um, continue encouraging physical distancing and hygiene and masking. And of course, we are all meant to um, adhere to the public health orders. Okay, so last week was a quick slide on flu. So yes, we do have um, the flu vaccine um, available. And um, you can get your shots at any of our COVID vaccine centers or other outlets or doctor's offices or, and pharmacies. Um, so that's the end of the presentation. Uh, I want to thank everyone again for this opportunity to come talk to you. I know how busy um, you have been and having to make these difficult decisions regarding this pandemic is not something I take lightly. And it's something that even us as MHOs, is something that we try to consider all aspects. And as members of our community as well, we, we do share your concerns. So please feel free if you've got any comments or questions, or if Trevor has anything else to add, um, Trevor, please. Sounds good. So I just wanted to add a few things, and thanks Dr. Annabelle for preparing that presentation, and thanks Mayor Roy and Council for having us. So with all this data presented and, and what this means, what this means for, for Wayburn. So when we face these ICU pressures, our system feels increased pressures in our Wayburn ER and our acute care. 
with patients being transferred to our hospital who are potentially sicker in order to deal with some of the some of the patients we're receiving in ICU in other sites such as the tertiary ICUs, so Kirk, Yorkton, North Battleford, PA, and so on. What do we do in order to allow for that? So to allow for that, we will always strive to keep Wayward Hospital continuing functioning. And what will happen is our rural facilities will send staff there and we'll make sure those are occurring. So it'll continue to increase the pressures on our hospitals. With that as well, we've already serviced slowdown in such areas such as foot care, dietitians, dental, and many more. From a spot, from the system perspective, there aren't transplants happening. Some elective procedures and surgeries aren't happening, and we are upscaling staff in order to meet the demand on staffing. I'm currently now in Yorkton, uh, helping out as a respiratory therapist because that's what I was before the director of primary health care in Wayburn there, just to, in order to offload some of that work. You know, with that, additionally, you know, Task Health Authority is continuing and working with the government in order to bring in support because where we're fe facing the highest of pressure right now is in our intensive care unit where we have the sickest of patients going to. So we continue to bring on staff that way and upskilling people who perhaps haven't worked in those areas uh, for a while so that they can be a functional member of our critical care team. Additionally, we're transporting patients, just like Dr. Annabelle mentioned, to Ontario and other places in order to increase the burden we have. So what does that mean for us in Wayburn? Uh, what we're seeing in, you know, in ICUs and you know, in deaths as well is, is non-vaccinated individuals. And when we put our good foot forward you know, for this consideration and consider you know, what sort of public health measures we can make in that Swiss cheese model, every little bit helps. And I just wanted to end with that, you know, whether it be you know, the recommendation we had earlier before the public health order in the city, that helped. And those are the type of steps forward we can do. So I just wanted to say thanks for having us. Thanks, Trevor, and thanks, uh, Dr. Annabelle, for attending the meeting. Is there any questions from council at all? And Go ahead, Laura. Thanks. Um, I don't know if they can hear me on the computer at all, can or if I should them? come any closer. Thank you so much. Not clearly on my end either. Uh, can you guys hear me now? I'm taking that as a no. Okay. I can ask some questions. Sure. I actually wrote it down for you. <laughs> uh, so this is a question, you guys, from uh, Councillor Morissette. Is the low, low vaccination rate attributed to accessibility to vaccination centers? Um, times uh, that clinics are offered. Um, so we're looking at uh, age groups that are not vaccinated. It seems to be working um, with school age residents uh, who make up the majority of those numbers of so people who are unvaccinated right now. Dr. Annabelle, would you want to start with that answer and then I can take a stab at the end part? Okay. Um, so, can you just clarify the question? Thank you, sorry about that. I just wanted to know if the low vaccination rate is attributed to the times that you're holding the vaccination clinics. If I work from nine to five, it's hard to make it to a clinic that's being held from nine to three. All right. Thank you, Councillor. that's a very good question. Um, so we try to be as flexible as possible, um, knowing that we all have different schedules and different work times. So I know in terms of accessibility, we try to make sure that we have clinics happen even after hours and even on weekends to be quite accommodating to different people and various settings as well. Um, for example, in physician offices, in our public health offices, and um, when we do have mass clinics, 
But secondly, um, we have seen that having that variety um, in terms of extended hours has been helpful. And if it's um, okay, we can also share, you know, our clean days, days and with those extended hours time um, for members here to distribute um, across their different networks. Um, so yes, we do have different options and extended times included, but I would um, allow Trevor to add to that too, because he's been very involved in our COVID vaccine rollout. Very cool, Brooke. Uh, thanks we do try to have one every couple of weeks that goes until seven o'clock. So those are bigger ones where you can either walk in or book and it's COVID and flu. Additionally, now like in Weyburn, you can just call the clinic, uh, call Weyburn Health Center and book in that way, just like you would a doctor's visit. So when I compare it to, you know, what, what we've done in the past to get the doctor, and you're right, sometimes it's not necessarily the perfect hour for that person working in self pod but you know it's a 15 minute uh 15 minute appointment to get your vaccine shot and now just as you would uh, a doctor visit at Waverly health center you just call there and you can get your vaccine whether it be flu or covid so and also like that being said extending that to we also have it offered regularly in our rural sites too in my opinion uh, and Fillmore along with some as well in Ogama and Radville too, so just expand on that. And the other piece I would say to it is that um, we're willing to increase those too. We just want to make, like if there's an event or increasing hours, just let me know and we can put some more hours to seven o'clock if you're finding that people in the community are bringing that up to you. I have two questions and I'll keep them really short so Matt can repeat them. First, uh, simply put, does the vaccine help prevent transmission? So they want to know if the vaccine helps um, stop transmission. Um, very good question and um, a common question that we get all the time. So what we identify, especially what recent studies are showing, is that um, for settings where you have that high um, vaccination rate, we are noticing a decrease in transmission in those settings. I remember seeing a study, was it from Ireland or the UK, that talked about they were comparing health workers, right? Who, um, they were health workers, they've been fully vaccinated, and their households who also have been fully vaccinated. And we're looking at breakthrough, like infections in both households as a comparison. So households, um, where you had majority of people unvaccinated, you tended to see more infections, like more individuals catching infection in those households. So that was what the study was about. So pointing to the fact that, yes, if you have a setting with most people who are vaccinated, um, you will less likely um, have any chance or the chances of catching the infection will be less. And also, the good thing about the vaccines, what current studies are also showing us is this, that yes, there's a breakthrough like if you're vaccinated and you do get this vaccine. What recent studies are showing is that over time, your shedding of the virus decreases rapidly as compared to the unvaccinated. So the time at which even that individual who is fully vaccinated sheds the infection is shorter in duration as compared to the unvaccinated. So there is less spread and there is less chance of, you know, infecting others around you. So the, that's what recent studies are showing. And I think the most, what we call like very important is that if you're fully vaccinated and you do catch COVID, your chances of getting those severe outcomes are really low. And I mean, the data shows it, the ones presented, that your chances of being hospitalized is far, far, far reduced. Your chances of ICU admission is also far, far reduced. And even your chances of mortality is also far, far reduced. So when I look at it, those are the pros for the vaccine. And we do know that if you wish to acquire this infection, you know, there's chances that you'll have those severe consequences, right? You may end up also in the hospital and in ICU, which if you're exposed with the vaccine, there is less chances of that happening. So those are some of the pros when it comes to getting vaccinated. I hope that helps. 
Absolutely. Uh, second and last question. Oh, sorry. Do you have something to add to that, Trevor? Yeah, I was just going to build on that just briefly on that end part. I can comment on shedding uh, for how that spreads, but, you know, in the ICU, that's what we're seeing. You know, younger people that you're not expecting to be in intensive care requiring the highest level of support uh, in people who are unvaccinated. I just wanted to add that. kind of shocked me. Okay, go ahead, Count Stranky. And my second and last question then. Does the vaccine help prevent the emergence of new variants? Uh, so they're asking about if the vaccine helps uh, reduce the emergence of, of new variants. Yeah, so that is, um, you know, the another challenging question, but very good question. Um, so, so far, we have seen that the vaccine is effective against this Delta variant. When you compare it to the class, um, the, um, COVID and the alpha variant. What we're finding is that um, it's about 90 something, I would say almost close to 98% with um, the, even the alpha variant and the classic variant. But with the delta, what we're noticing is it's about anywhere between 60 to 80, early 80 percentage in terms of effectiveness, which is something that is really good. I mean, it might when compared to the classic, not the same in the 90s, but between the 60s to the 80s. So it does offer a good protection. Um, we cannot say what the virus at this time could evolve to in terms of variants, but we do know that at least with the current variants and even with Delta, the vaccine has been shown to be effective. Any other questions from Council at all? Only a great deal of thank you. A huge thank you from Council uh, to Trevor and to Dr. Annabelli for, for attending the meeting tonight. Thank you for presenting that information to us. Uh, it's very beneficial for um, both Council and the public to hear the information you guys provide. So thanks. And I know you guys are quite busy. So thanks for coming to our meeting tonight. Uh, thanks for having us too. And it's a pleasure. And I hope to continue working with Council on other um, health related, public health related issues. I did hear um, you were looking at your water treatment plant and I'm happy to hear that because it's one of the things that we also are interested in in public health and also other social determinants of health issues. Um, I think our goal is the same. We want to improve population health, we want to protect and um, prevent any form of health concerns in our population. So I'm glad that you could have us here today. I'm looking forward to working with you as well. Trevor? Yeah, the only thing I'd say is that for sure, just like Dr. Annabelli said, that's the whole goal is just to be free. Um, with that being said, I know a number of counselors and mayor and uh, staff within the city of Weyburn have my cell, so call or text or email. And if there's any other questions or things, you just text me or call, whichever. Hey, thanks for your time tonight, guys. I'll let you over this meeting so you don't have to be here any longer, and we'll keep on our discussion tonight. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Go ahead, Matthew. Yeah, one second, Your Worship, here. Just trying to find everything here. There we go. Um, so with the information provided tonight, um, we do want to look a little further into more of an implementation plan, uh, proof of vaccination or negative tests. Um, so big thing for us is that requirements for our uh, facilities do align right now, uh, mostly with um, what the government sketch put within their health order. Um, the implementation would also uh, follow the process and procedures identified through the public health orders for programs and services in our facilities. Uh, the plan being um, proposed uh, by administration for city facilities follows the current mandates for isolation and uh, face covering and the proof of uh, COVID-19 vaccination and negative tests, uh, which, which the public order is within the sketch right now. So I'll go through really quick uh, within the mandatory isolation and, and face covering um, as of October 19th. Um, so subject to exemptions set out in subsection C, D, E, all individuals shall wear a face covering when in the following enclosed areas. Uh, regarding our uh, facilities, cultural or en entertainment services, 
Uh, another thing we also have within uh, that is a uh, place for sport and recreational activities such as gyms, ice arenas, pools, uh, gymnastics uh, facilities, dance facilities, and other indoor court and uh, field facilities. Uh, places used to hold events or uh, hosting gatherings such as conferences, conventions, and receptions, and municipal uh, locations, so our buildings that we run as a city of Weyburn. Um, face coverings are not required um, for the following individuals. Individuals 18 years of um, age or older and on ice uh, court uh, officials while participating in sport or fitness activities for the duration of the fitness or uh, sport activity, uh, so as long as there is a subject to a proof of vaccination policy. Uh, second one is, is for individuals who are under the age of 18 while participating in sport and only for the duration of the sport. Uh, second um, uh, thing I'll go through is a proof of vaccination and negative test, which is as of the October 19th uh, health measure. Um, so section two talks about the requirement uh, subject to um, se subsection D and subsections A and B apply with respect to the premises of the following. Um, so events uh, that uh, in have ticketed events. Uh, so that example, that would be a Red, Red Wing game. Uh, and then ones that have GST charges as well and fitness centers and gyms. Um, so uh, within section three, exemptions uh, for business and organizations, the following business and organizations or portions of the business organization are exempt from the requirement of imposed uh, pursuant to subsections 2A to uh, I. Uh, so the facilities hosting amateur sporting events, including youth athletics and recreational uh, leagues. Um, so I won't go too far into this because we've heard this lots from the province of Saskatchewan. Um, there is a proof of vaccination. Uh, so according to the province of Saskatchewan, there's acceptable um, forms that they require for when you have to provide proof of vaccination. Uh, also for proof of negative test, uh, there's also uh, accepted forms um, for this. One thing that is not accepted is self-administered take-home rapid antigen tests um, would not be accept accepted in anything for the government right now. And then ID requirements. They always talk about ID requirements and anyone over the age of 18 is required to have an ID. Anyone uh, 12 to 17, um, unless in accompanied by an adult going through for something. So I do have Director uh, Crow here to talk about um, some things we want to look at for our facilities moving forward based on the current health measures provided by the province of Saskatchewan. Good evening, Council. Um, so as uh, Matthew, or City Manager Warren mentioned, uh, he wanted to have me involved in this conversation just to go over uh, what the recommendation uh, will affect when it comes to all City of Weyburn public facing facilities. Um, so we've just done a quick breakdown here um, of what we would see in each facility if this uh, recommendation went forward by council tonight so i will say before getting into this that the current recommendation you see in front of you isn't as strict or as hard-lined as what they may have in saskatoon prince albert and i believe uh, the city of regina is looking at something today um, we aren't looking for a mandatory proof of vaccination for all who enter the facilities uh, rather just for certain parts of that facility usage um, so, for instance, uh, uh, City Hall, um, with this recommendation, uh, the public would still have access into the facility to pay bills or take care of uh, matters at the front desk. However, uh, there would be a requirement for proof of vaccination or um, negative COVID test to access uh, council chambers or uh, meeting rooms for committee meetings or board meetings that to that regard. Um, that would also be the case for the police station um, and the public works building as well. There would be access to the public um, to enter the facility to deal uh, at the front desk as necessary, but if they wanted to um, enter that facility for any length of time to participate in meetings or anything that will really hold them there for longer than that 15 minute window, we would ask that they would be uh, providing us with proof of uh, negative test or vaccination. Um, so over at the Weyburn Leisure Centre, um, you'll see some similarities with the Credit Union Spark Centre, the Weyburn Leisure Centre, Crescent Point Place and Tom Zandy Sports Arena. Um, at the Leisure Centre and the Credit Union Spark Centre, 
um, proof of vaccination would be, or, or negative test would be required for eight, adults 18 years of age and older to access those recreation amenities. Uh, at that time when they do access those amenities, so be it the track, the mini gym, the turf field, or the swimming pool, um, they could then remove their mask and participate without the mask on, which is something, uh, again, what uh, City Manager Warren spoke to, uh, there's currently a clause that states if we had a proof of vaccination policy, our, the members of, of the City of Weyburn would have access to those facilities without, without a mask on when engaged in physical activity. Uh, this would also uh, pertain to any of the officials, uh, referees, uh, anybody on the actual game uh, surface or the, the deck if you're at the swimming pool. Um, this would not pertain to anybody spectating at these facilities. So right now, um, it would sit that if you were going simply to watch your child on the play and climb structure on the soccer field, at the skating rink, play their game, you would not be required to provide proof of vaccination. It, it, this recommendation uh, pertains only to those actively engaged in physical activity. Um, and then, of course, is, is for ticketed older, events. 18 and older, right? Yes, 18 and older uh, is what we're recommending with this. Um, so just some further clarification through talking to the business response team today. Um, although the public health order speaks to uh, things kind of more specific to sport, they basically said that whenever um, uh, someone 18 years of old, age or older or uh, youth up to the age 17 is engaged in physical activity. Um, should they be following a proof of vaccination requirement, um, they would not need to wear their mask while engaged in that activity. Is there anything else you need? Uh, I have one question. How close do you stand on Sundays? Do we have to wear a mask to that? Yeah, so I received some further clarification for that. So effective starting next weekend, um, children and youth up to the age 17 no longer need to uh, wear their masks while actively engaged on the ice. They, they still require them to access the facility and in the change rooms and whatnot. Um, unless this policy is passed, however, adults will still require a mask to participate in public skating. Should this, pol uh, should this procedure go through or this recommendation go through uh, where we require proof of vaccination for uh, those physical uh, activities activities, um, then adults would not require their masks if they pr provided us with their proof of vaccination or negative test result. So if I go public skating Sunday and show you I've been vaccinated, I don't put this on? Um, that would not come into effect until I believe we stated November 8th, but that, that would be correct, yes. So you would provide your proof of vaccination at the door and you would wear your mask until you entered the ice surface and then you could remove your, your face mask. Mr. Jenkins, go ahead. You're, oh, I thought you were reading to, reaching to uh, press the mic, go ahead. Actually, Dick asked, asked my question, but just to be clear on this, this would allow us to take a lot of the mask mandates off of people participating in uh, sports across, not just at uh, the skating, but across the uh, all facilities. Correct, yes, so with the proof of vaccination policy, we are able to allow uh, athletes 18 years, or, or I say athletes, but anybody from the general public active in physical activity, the ability to remove their masks when active um, on that area. And the 12 to 17 age group uh, not being a part of that, that was under the public health order? Yes, Secret? that is also included in the public health er order, um, which is actually in place already today. Okay, perfect, yeah. thank you. And I guess, Andrew, that was the thing is because, as you said, that um, Saskatoon and, and especially Prince Albert is, I sit at these mayor's meetings and they're over the top and they're wanting proof of vaccination for 12 and up and they're just so over the top on all this stuff. So we are following the government guidelines, right, at the thing by, asking, by saying we're doing the minimum government guidelines, right? 
Yeah, so we are following the government guidelines to allow our participants 18 years and older to be active without the use of a face mask. That's, and that's all I'm saying is that we're back to what Dick and I had said one time. Let's follow the government guidelines and let's not go over the top like Prince Albert and, and these big city these big city mayors and, and that. They're fighting, the government is fighting with the big city mayors already and we don't want to get into this fray at all. We, let's just follow the, the government guidelines and be... Uh, at the low uh, end of everything else. I will just state for clarification, because um, you guys need to discuss and, and talk this one through before passing any recommendation, that should this recommendation go through, individuals who are not vaccinated would not have access to those amenities. I just need to point that out. We aren't permitted to allow non-vaccinated without the proof of a negative test individuals to participate in the same area as those who are vaccinated without a mask on. So I just wanted to clarify if that makes sense to you. If I may, Go ahead. I'm gonna ask you to clarify that one yes. more time. It's hard to explain. So you would have individuals yes. who are fully vaccinated on the playing field, whatever, without their mask on. Yes. Somebody who is unvaccinated, but has provided a proof of negative test could also be on that field without their mask on. That is correct. However, if they couldn't provide either of those two things, they could they could not even participate. Correct. They, even with a mask, they couldn't come onto the field to participate. That is correct. Thank you. Your Worship, thank you so much. Andrew, um, if you can clarify as well, so my kids are participating in indoor soccer. If I'm not vaccinated, I can still enter the Spark Centre to watch them or no? Yes, so this policy would have no effect on spectators, uh, whether it be at the Spark Centre, um, at the arenas, at the swimming pool. Um, as a spectator, uh, you, can, you can move freely with a mask on. So, go ahead, Mr. Richards. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Gotta, sorry, Andrew, I have a few more questions. Uh, I'm going to start with City Hall. So, uh, access to council chambers and meeting rooms would be proof of negative test or a COVID-19 vaccination. Correct. Now, what would we do if a member of the public wanted to be here tonight to participate in, in the proceedings and they were unable to provide either of those two things? How would we address that? Do you want to answer? I will answer that. Um, Thank you. So right now that is a requirement that you would be saying as a city that you require them to attend the meeting. Uh, we would have to look at alternate um, avenues for them to attend and to ask questions into the meeting. Uh, something that we would have to look further look into with our, our clerks and our other city managers. Okay. Uh, but I know that when we were going virtually um, on Zoom, same kind of thing, we would have to set up other alternatives for them to. So, we, so there would be options available. We would have to look into options yeah. for that. Thank you. So my next question is about uh, folks that may have an exemption for whatever reason. Is that a piece of documentation that you're familiar with? Is that something that our staff, city staff, would be able to recognize? Or I guess my question, and I apologize, and maybe that shows up on your app if you have an exemption. I don't know. So I, I worry about it because, you know, we all have friends whose kids work for the city. Um, and I just imagine somebody at the door trying to understand if that exemption is legitimate or, or what. Yeah, so I've been working with some other cities uh, who have already placed these uh, proof of negative tests or vaccination uh, policies, um, and they've provided me with what these may look like. It's, it's also my understanding that if you receive a certified proof of negative test, it actually goes right onto your SASC eHealth, so that's the main form of, of accepting that. Um, but we would definitely provide those staff with all the different tools that we could so that they were prepared. Um, it is something that we have our concerns about and we will address uh, with that frontline staff because they're the ones that uh, unfortunately wear the brunt of uh, the negative uh, comments and, and attitudes coming in the door when people aren't permitted to do something. Thanks. Perhaps. So again, point of clarification, just to make sure that I've got Jeff's question right. So if everybody is with proof of vaccination, they're gonna take their masks off. If people are unvaccinated, even though that they're wearing a mask, they can't participate. Unless they provide us proof of negative test. As per the public health order. 
That's the current public health order. That's the current public health order. Yeah, but I'm just saying is that uh, they they can still they can still participate with a mask on if they show uh, negative test. Uh, they right. wouldn't need. And older. They would not require their mask if they had their permanent or their uh, negative test results. So I'll give you an example. So for our adult rec hockey league to get started this year, right. um, we queried our. Uh, I want to call them athletes, but you know the has been athletes. Uh, we asked them <laughs> what they would. Pre <laughs> I'm I'm one of them, unfortunately. Uh, we asked them what they would prefer, uh, either Terrible. a all all. Uh, a league donning all masks or a league where you would require that proof of vaccination status and they overwhelmingly were on the side of uh, wanting that proof of vaccination so this is a policy that we've uh, done to a different degree within our adult rec league so be that uh, adult recreational hockey and volleyball already um, we also have other user groups such as uh, Weyburn Soccer Association who has adult soccer Soccer going on in the Spark Center with their own proof of vaccination policy uh, so that their athletes are, are able to participate without a mask on and we have organizations like the Weyburn Red Wings who have a really good uh, plan in place uh, to allow their athletes to participate without masks on as well. So these user groups are all behind you on this? All the ones that I've spoken to, yep. Mr. Bruce. Thanks Your Worship. And that was, that was my next question. You've talked to the user groups. Um, now, there's a couple of user groups sitting behind you, actually, that I'm interested in. Uh, I don't think the fire hall public works is as big a concern, uh, but the police station is a concern because I don't think that the chief will stop somebody from coming in, uh, whether they're in an emergency or, Lord forbid, they've got to go into one of those rooms that's got the bars across the door. Uh, so have, I assume, and I, I'm sure you've sat with the chief and you've worked through how this impacts both chiefs, I guess, how this impacts their operations. I will answer that. It's okay. only for meetings. It's only for committee meetings. It's not for when prisoners come in right. or if they're doing questioning of people. That's operations that, um, sorry, Jim, I want me to speak for you, but, yeah. but uh, Chief Blunden would have in place for those kind of things. This is when we have committee meetings in our buildings that are more than 15 minutes. Okay. So this does not include when people come to pay bills. This, it, this is when something happens for more than 15 minutes when you have those sit down meetings for our committees, councils, all those kind of things mm -hmm. that way. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Chief Allman, similar for you? No concerns with this coming into play? No concerns from the part chief. Thank you. I think that's it for me. I guess I would just wrap it up by saying, uh, I totally get that this is not ideal living conditions for anybody, but I am far more in favor of this than restricting activities again, like we had to do last year. This is a much, pardon the pun, easier pill to swallow. Yeah. I'll just go through my final part of my report. Thank you, uh, uh, Director Crow, for answering those questions. Um, I brought Andrew here tonight because uh, he will be having the majority of the questions uh, that way. The one thing we have talked about is creating a requirements guide, similar to what our MISPAs have done to, to hopefully alleviate some of those questions that we may have and that may happen as it goes forward. Uh, not a reason why we're not implementing this on Friday or Monday. We want to give a two-week period to at least get this implemented into a proper process to also continue to work with the government. We know things continue to change at a government level, um, but we are trying to follow what's within the guidelines right now. Um, and that's why the um, big thing for us is that we have those discussions um, with the province and we make sure we understand those requirements. The business response team is available um, Monday through Friday uh, for us to ask questions and to understand that and something that we've been doing on a regular basis. Uh, so the recommendation I have in front of council is the city waiver and our uh, city council implements a proof of vaccination or negative test requirements for the city waiver and facilities effective Monday, November 8th. Your Worship, I'll make a motion that we adopt the uh, our recommendations as laid out before us. I'll second that. Worship. Any more discussion? November 8th. Is that 
Would we be able to push that back a bit more so that other user groups are able to do, say, seven days, November 15th? Your user groups are currently following this process as Director Crotus went through. He has his volleyball groups, he has his hockey groups that are already following within this. We're actually expanding this more for other operations within our facilities. Okay. And again, this affects, does not, this is only for 18 and over. As per the health, public health order. Yeah, right. This doesn't affect your 12 and over like Prince Albert is going When, when there. someone is 12 to 17, yeah. they fit within what the current public health order states. If they're active in an activity, even beforehand, they were not required within the public health order to do that. So long as it's not affecting that 12 to 17, and they can say, and then as the adults, they can make their own decisions on this. Okay. Call the question. All in favor? Moving forward. Okay. And with that, uh, choirs and announcements. Statements. Nothing? Go ahead. Oh, I thought you were going to say something, John. No? And uh, the, uh, you know, there's no notice of uh, motion. And with that, we will call an adjournment to the meeting.